Okay, thank you. Um, I will be the first presenter after lunch. In the, the northern part of Sweden, where I come from, we have a name, a Swedish name for, for this hour. It's Paltkoma. <laughs> I, think, I think in German, I mean, it's like uh, knödel. You're eating too much knödel and then you, you need to digest. So it's, it's more or less that. So that's why I put, put this clothing on. So when you feel tired and you start to fall asleep, then you have to focus on the yellow dot. <laughs> okay, guys, what I will talk about today is um, the 5G mine or why James Cameron is wrong. And by some strange reason, I got some help from uh, our communication department and they thought it was a good idea to have a big picture on me on the first page. I disagree. So, what is really nice when you are up on the, on the stage and then you are, are performing this kind of speech in front of people, it is that now they can't stop me. So what I really will talk about is not mind safety because that's, that's uh, too boring. So I will talk about why James Cameron is wrong, but also diabetes and the We Are Not Waiting initiative. And for Ericsson, special for you, Torbjörn, why table tennis can prove that Ericsson is right. Okay. How many of you have been uh, in a mine underground? A lot of you. Could you imagine how it must have been back in time to be working underground in, in the mines? It must have been a very dark and lonely and, and dangerous place. I will talk more about that and how it has changed. Why innovate in mining? Why am I here? I mean, if you look at the mining industry as such, it's not world famous for spending a lot of money on R&D. That said, the mining companies in Sweden, we at least we try. And I would say the key drivers are actually the fact that we have high labor cost. We also have a strict environmental regulations and we also have low tolerance for work related injuries. And then you could think that this is something that me and my colleagues interpret as negative drivers but that's not true because it's i mean it's wonderful that my colleagues are, are well paid of course you want to to do a good job when it comes to the environment both externally and internally and of course you want your colleagues to come home at the evening safe and sound okay then we have these pictures that we always show when we're out it's from the communication department we are bragging this is uh, some benchmarking figures that is being put together. And you can see that our underground mine in uh, Garpenberg is the most efficient underground mine in the world when it comes to, to sink production. That said, these figures are a bit old, so we have done a lot of improvement work after this. When it comes to our open pit mine in Aitik, you can see that uh, the figures is even better. So then, as a Swede, I could stand in front of you and then I could say, yes, we are more hardworking. We are smarter than the rest of the world. And I would be lying. So what is the reason that we have been so successful? The reason is quite simple. We need to embrace the technology. We need to use new technology. So if you look at the technology used in our mines, we use much more technology than other mining companies. That's the answer. Higher level of automation. So, why James Cameron is wrong? Do you know this guy? Have you seen his movies? Do we have somebody from ABB here? We have. Okay. They are always present. You know, they have something they call next level of mining. So he has to, to be irritating them. I always claim that we are already ahead of them. Next, next level of mining. Always works. So you have seen the Cameron vision. I mean, he could imagine the stories behind Avatar and Terminator. He also imagined space travel and cryosleep. And did you know that this guy, I think it was privately financed, that he was the first guy that went down in the Mariana Graven, the Challenger Deep, in 52 years. But he couldn't imagine, and this is from Avatar, he couldn't imagine a mining truck on this planet without a driver. 
So we know that James Cameron is wrong because Volvo construction equipment will start the testing of a remotely controlled reloader this year in one of our mines. Volvo Trucks plans to test the first truck equipped with the autopilot in our mines in Kistnaberg. We have Bolid and Kankberg will be the first mine with a 5G network. And Scania plan to test the first truck equipped with autopilot in Bolid and Renström. So we know it will start to happen already this year. So now I will have two pictures that normally when I do this kind of speech, I, don't, I need to convince people that it's likely that this will happen. I mean, that's not the case with you guys. So I mean, this is the, the success that Ericsson had, was it 2015 in Barcelona, when you have this excavator that was remotely controlled from Barcelona. So you can see that remote control on machines are possible to do already today. We have this platooning, sorry, Sorry that it's Volvo trucks. I will <laughs> swap that to Scan and next time I promise you, special for you. So that said, now we'll talk about diabetes. My daughter has diabetes, so I, I have some interest in this field. But what I found was really interesting, it was I was attending something called Techonomy in uh, Silicon Valley last year, together with Ericsson. And uh, it was a lot of different speeches. One of them was about uh, intellig artificial intelligence, and it was called God in a Box. And they had discussions regarding if who is responsible if you have an, in, uh, a smart algorithm, for example, that is testing your uh, and approve your how the value you have for credit uh, for banking it turns into a racist. It was that kind of discussion. It was quite high level. And in the end of the discussion, what was even more interesting, it was that one of the, the experts on artificial intelligence, she was talking out from her heart about something completely else. She was talking about something that was called We Are Not Waiting Initiative. And the whole pitch with that, when he spoke in front of the people, it was that she was so sick and tired that a lot of companies were uh, preventing her son from getting the best treatment. So I googled it when I came home and this is what you will see. This is the state of the art today. You have an insulin pump and you have something called a CG CGM, continuous glucosis measurement. As engineers you can th think that somebody has close closed this loop, but it's not done yet. And one of the reasons are, this is the diabetes market today. <clears throat> you can see that it's silos of data and they do not exchange data. And for us in the mining business, you could see very much the same thing. You have Atlas Copco products, you have Sandvik products, you have Caterpillar products and you have Volvo products. And the whole idea is that you are supposed to use their own software. That said, if, when I show this picture, it's always somebody that, from Atlas Copco that calls me and says that, but hey, we let you get, you can get all the data that you want from our products. And that is true. But my point is, if I tell them that they will give the data to Sunvik, I'm not sure that they will get the same answer. And when it comes to Volvo, I don't know what kind of data ex exchange you have with, uh, with Scania? How they, do you exchange data between your systems? Some, but probably not too much. So if you look at, um, <laughs> if you surf out on the internet, then you could find something that is quite cool. It's called the Diabetes Mine. This is this initiative where you could find this We Are Not Waiting initiative. And it's pretty cool because they have been quite successful to, to put some pressure on, on people that is now developing insulin pumps, etc. in the US. And these are their statements. The first one, we are not waiting to bridge disconnected data islands. We are not waiting for competitors to cooperate. We are not waiting for regulators to regulate. We are not waiting for the cure. If you take away this part and look at the first three, 
Don't you think that that is a quite beautiful statement for all the Internet of Things? Okay, what they are aiming for and their vision, it's very much the diabetes tomorrow. They want all the companies to share the data so it will be possible for other people to start to build better applications for people that, that has this illness. And of course, the vision of a digital pancreas. I mean, for you guys, I mean, you understand that if you have a Fitbit and you have the pulse rate that is uploaded, you know that you have the figures of the, the glucose level and you have the feedback, you have the calendar from your smartphone, the positioning. For example, for my daughter, when she is heading to doing some exercise, then the system could say, yes, she went in this direction last week and she worked really hard. Perhaps it's time for her to, to have a, a lower level of insulin because she went a bit low on glucose. And then, of course, as a parent, even if she, she is 27 years old and she is a doctor, I still want to have an alarm if she is going unconscious. And that service I don't know if I can buy today. So now we have this thing about um, table tennis. But I think I will stop there for a moment and change my plans. Because the first part of this presentation was very much about open data. And when you are under NDA with Scania and Volvo, you have a problem when you're standing in front of people because you don't, you, it's hard to talk openly because you don't want to reveal something that is secret. But if you have not received the information, then I guess that you can speak because no one has really answered my question. So when I, I ask Volvo, for example, Volvo, if they plan to share their software with, let's say, Scania, I don't really get an answer. If I, if I ask them if they plan to share the data with Mercedes, the answer is no way or maybe. So I don't know if I, if I ask the same questions to, to Scania, if what the opinion you have to share the data. Because if you look at the presentation that we have seen today, Sooner or later, you will have some sort of software that will be the fleet manager, keeping control over all the vehicles in the network. And you are talking about, for example, for Scania, that they have 5% of the market in Germany. But if you look at, uh, for example, for us in Boliden, we don't care if it's a Volvo, Scania or Mercedes. We want to have the same software that is working for all these companies. And today they think that they have some sort of benefit if they don't share the data with the competitors. But on the other hand, I would just send a message now when we have some representatives from the... If you think like this, you will probably in the truck business be the first one that really deploy vehicles that will be out without a driver. Because if you look at the normal cars, they are talking more about having some sort of system that will assist a driver for a long period of time. But in the truck business, the business case is more or less to get rid of the driver. You saw one third of the cost. So that means that you will be ahead of the car industry. Imagine that you join your forces and come up with a software that could manage a large fleet of, of, um, of trucks. What have you then built? It must be something that is a logistical system. That will probably be one of the most interesting softwares that you could buy today in the world because you could see how goods is transported all over the world. The more partners you get into that software. So maybe, and this is about transformation, maybe Scania will be a software company in the future. Or just fruit salad. Okay, about table tennis. This is a picture that I have borrowed from Ericsson. And I think it's quite... I mean, it's, it, 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 it's a good one. I mean, I guess this is more or less... At least a year ago, this was always in your presentations. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> no, but it, it, it's a good one. Because I remember what you said when I was attending one of your speeches. It was about this, this important to realize that 
we are in a transformation. So then I always pick up this banknote. And then people think that I will talk about money. And they are wrong. If you have told people working in banks 20 years ago that you will be working in a bank office without cash, would they have believed the guy that said it? And think about this. Who come up with the idea that it's a good idea to change all the banknotes in Sweden to new ones? Isn't that a really bad timing? When we have stopped using them. Do you use cash? I never do. I, f I forget what, what you are using them for. So I send them into the, to the washing machine and everything. And they're quite good quality in the paper. So that is a message I send out when I have this kind of speech in front of people from the industry. You guys are too smart. I don't need to convince you. You know that we have a transformation ongoing. But it is important to send me this message also internally in a mining company like Bull Eden. Then we have this discussion about 5G and what 5G will provide. So um, we have been looking into this from, uh, from the mining industry's per perspective, come up to the following conclusion. Latency. Everybody is talking about latency. But this is a really neat movie. I will not show it for you, but I guess that this presentation will be available. Click on this link, because this is a company in Umeå that is selling uh, bandwidth, an uh, ISP. This is really cool, because what they have done is that they have put uh, Oculus Rift on a guy, a camera and a computer and a remote control, so they can change how much, much latency he has on his own eyes, what he see. Try to do table tennis with a lot of latency. Or this girl, she is attending also, I think, aerobics with latency. And the guy is also trying to, I think he is doing pancakes. Everything in life is difficult with latency. Could you imagine then if you will control, for example, a charging robot that is feeding explosives into the dr drill holes in our mines? I guess that we need to have a better control over that. So then we have the next slide from Ericsson. This strange thing about network slicing. No one in, 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 um, in mining really understands this until I explain that it's a way how you can buy the quality that you need to do, for example, remote control. I don't know if that interpretation is completely right, but it's the closest I can get. Because if I tell them that we have a mine on Ireland, and if you, we want to take control of a machine on Ireland, and then the British come to the conclusion that, yes, it's a, it's a really good uh, game on, uh, on the telly. We want to see this game, and then start to log in on the computers, etc. So we start to introduce more latency in the network in Great Britain. And we have the cabling passing by. What will happen that started up, when we started up the remote control of this machine, it's worked quite well. And then we have game night, and then everything stops to work. That's not possible. So I guess that if we will get these network slices from Ericsson, then we could buy a network slice, and we could have this remote control over machines. So that is important. Then we have energy performance. And when you send your script to the marketing department, I don't really know how they succeeded to interpret a Duracell battery or energizer battery to this picture. But it's really nice, don't you say? This is from one of our mines. You can see that we have a lot of power to our mine. And you can see a lot of windmills. We have them in Sweden. The, 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 the power is used in a southern part of the country, but they don't want to look at them, so then send them up to the north where we live. <laughs> But nevertheless, this picture is totally wrong. But then I can tell you the story about the windmills. But what it really is about not energy performance in the micro, sc micro scale, it's a micro scale. I mean, it's about, imagine a mine, and you have a lot of new cool sensors. It could be, you can measure temperature, it could be gas sensors. Do you want to go there every six months and change the batteries? We don't have the, the, the business case for that. So what this is really about and what's important if you will start to use this kind of technology in mining, it is for sure that you have 
much more energy efficient sensors. It's really important. Then, of course, we also have cost, but I will come back to that. So then, why 5G? We have latency, we have network slices, energy performance, and we have cost. And um, to be able to test this new technology, we have teamed up with a lot of other companies. You can see them down here. It's ABB, Boleden, Ericsson. We have Telia Sonora, we have Volvo. And what is really interesting when you try to achieve something like the mine automation program in Boleden, it is that you need to be aware of the resources you have yourself and the resources you can get by teaming up with other companies. If you try to summarize how much R&D these com big companies are spending every year, and you do the, the, the sum up on one year, it's enough money to run Boolean mine automation program that I'm heading for 5,000 years. <laughs> so uh, one message is that it's, it's a smart thing to team up with good people that has a lot of money. And I then try to uh, convince them to do what you need. <laughs> It's cheaper. So nevertheless, we have this, uh, this project, this pilot project ongoing together with Ericsson that is building out the 5G network. And uh, this was the time schedule that we put up, the time plan. And believe it or not, this Thursday in March, we have first light in the network and it's up and running now. So we are on timetable. And this is a picture I got from Ericsson just a couple of, of days ago. It's the measurements that they have done in one of our... <laughs> this is an area where you have taken out ore, so it's quite complex. And you see that they have, have walked around and measured the data throughput. It's a bit confusing because this is uplink, but they are talking about the downlink power. So, but I think that you can get the picture. With one radio base station, you have quite good coverage. And now over to the cost thing. Even though the Ericsson equipment is a little bit more expensive, if we will create the same coverage with the Cisco access points for Wi-Fi, we will probably need three of them. So here you see the business opportunity, how we can reduce cost. Because underground, it could be a good idea to have less equipment, because they have a tendency to break down, or somebody break it down by running it over or something. Okay, so in the future we are working with a lot of companies, I think it's three of them, that want to build drones that could fly underground. And you could, could probably ask the question, why do you need drones underground? And the reason is you have a lot of areas in the mine where you, where you don't want to go, but you need to do a lot of inspections. For example, ore passes. So it's a really good idea to send a drone flying down in the ore pass to see what has happened, or into where you have a production area where you have instability in the roof. So then the people from the geology department could look and see if it's really safe or not without really walking into this room. We are also working with augmented reality. We are working with Cisco. Sorry, but you have a cooperation now ongoing. Oh, yeah, it's your partner. So we are looking into the hall of technology for positioning. And of course with Ericsson when it comes to 5G. Okay. You have already realized that means my discussion here about the James Cameron, it was not about James Cameron. It was about sending the message that the new technology is already here. I was not talking about diabetes. I was talking about the need for open data. And when it comes to 5G, what you need to remember that we ha have identified in the, in the industry is latency, network slices, and energy performance, and maybe cost. In the beginning, it was all dark. <laughs> we can now see the light in the end of the tunnel. <laughs> it is the train coming, and it's written mine automation and 5G all over it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So time for a few questions. Klaus. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know Let's wait for the, the mic. Yeah. <laughs>
No, but uh, no, Peter and I met before. The, to, today, uh, you already have thousands of radio systems installed in your minds, and and sort of, and you have. Uh, I don't know if you or LQAB, I think, has uh, several. Uh, they have you have trains running at thousand meters level down in the in the mines, all remotely controlled by radio, and they they have been existing since the 80s, I think, at least uh, early 90s, and uh, and they are sort of uh, performing well with the radio equipment from a from a, an, a vendor in the western part of Sweden, <laughs> in Björbo. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> so. Uh, how can you, that then you have an ecosystem for the things that exist there today with uh, uh, orchestrums and Björbo. and but do you see uh, there's going to be a new ecosystem here with uh, Ericsson? Uh, uh, and, I mean they are op- they are operating in the 433 megahertz band, which is a unlicensed industry band. But now do you see a new ecosystems with uh, new vendors like Ericsson? With Telia providing uh, connectivity and assurance for connectivity, or how do you see sort of the change from you going from those 1,000 systems from orchestrums to this 5G world? I would say that if you look, for example, for orchestrums, um, I would say that the need for more dedicated hardware. I still think that we have that, but in the smelters, because we have really rough environment, also radio-wise, in, in some of the smelters. So I don't know if it's if you just could take off-the-shelf products from Ericsson or from Cisco and put them into that environment and make them work. But underground, I would say that the radio environment is quite good. And, and if you think about it, people talking about that the mines is a really tough environment. But on the other hand, the weather is quite stable. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would say that the answer on your question is that I'm quite safe. On the, I think I'm on the safe side when I say underground. I think that we could use a lot of standardized products, but if you move to our smelters where you have very high, um, what do you call it, emissions is wrong. I mean, magnet felt, uh, yes. EMC fields from, for example, electrolysis work that runs, runs, etc. Uh, I think that that there you need special solution. So, so when it comes to 5G or 4G or, or um, products from, from Cisco, I think that the benefit from the mining industry is actually that you could reuse stuff that is developed for other businesses. I mean, for example, the handsets that the miners are, are using in our mines today is, is actually developed for hospitals. Because if you, if you clean them with alcohol, they must stand that. And because they are built for that purpose, they also have an IP classification, then they work underground. Of course, the miners need them to accept that it's white and blue. And maybe in the future, they will also be pink. But they can take that. OK, one more question. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, actually, seven, eight years ago, I have been to Bolivia mine once. Uh, in uh, yeah, and one interesting thing I I observed is that uh, uh, it's it's not in in, in like, like a hole. It's like an open but very deep. It's, oh yeah, the yeah. open pit. Was yeah. it in Nitec? Yeah, well, yeah. and very deep and around. Yeah. And uh, uh, one um, one thing is uh, this. You mentioned that it's, it's a Wi-Fi system, like in um, you. I mean, this is milli R. You you mentioned that that if you use Wi-Fi, then it could be more devices, more, more yeah. sites, yeah. Uh, but actually, um, in this environment, uh, Wi-Fi might not f- uh, not working, not working. <laughs> no, because it was a stupid idea to begin with, to have a yeah, Wi-Fi network. Be- because the, the CP could be, I mean, the, yeah, the, yeah this is... The reflections from the other side is that the guard time can't yeah, yeah, take exactly. care of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The CP yeah. is always the CP, so it makes the very inefficient. But I can tell you the, 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 the story behind it. It was that we tried to approach Tele and buy, uh, on commercial terms, uh, a 4G coverage for the mine. Yeah. They didn't really, they didn't even answer us. Oh. So the <laughs> problem was to build the network ourselves. And now when we have confronted them with this kind of information, we have talked with high managers high up in the organization. They claim that if you approach them today, now we can, can buy this kind of solution. So perhaps it was just a little bit too early. But I fully agree with you. 
we would never choose Wi-Fi in in in, in the open pit mine. It was just really stupid because it's a lot of problems. To we need to tilt the antennas so we we don't send energy, so you get uh, reflections from the other side, and it's it's, it's really a mess. Okay, thank I agree you. with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's thank uh, Peter again for a nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.